fired up, you're good to start. Hello, everyone. I am Shay. Um, not going to be playing a game so much today, but I am going to be reading a bit. Um, I'm not sure how much people are going to like it. I hope people do like it. Uh, and I'll see how this goes, and if people do like it, then I'll continue. But, um, essentially what I'll be doing, I'll be reading, um, I'll be reading a novel, and, you know, folks can talk and chat and discuss stuff, and we can see how it goes. Um, but, yeah, I think that's it. I don't have anything special. Um, other than that. Why don't you but I do. Off? I was gonna I'm sorry. Say, why I'm going to say, why don't you start off by telling us what you're reading and who the author is? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, well, partly just fiddling around and trying to get this, uh, Twitch to light up. But yeah, um, so basically I'm going to be reading a novel called Shipbreaker uh, by Paolo Bacigalupi. Really hard name to pronounce. Um, but essentially it's, you know, post apocalyptic setting. Uh, things are generally relatively bad maybe it'll be some good inspiration for for you know some of the dms to be throwing in their games if they want um but um it'll just be following the story for a couple of young people who are just trying to survive um but I figured, I figured it was it was an interesting book for me, and this is kind of a toned down version of uh, my favorite book, which is much more um, violent and less censored. Um, uh, but yeah, that's about the um, you know the extent of what I'll be diving into. What about you, Erin? Do you have any thoughts? Nope. Just what I sent you. Um, other than that, I think we're good to get rolling. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Okay, did not think that through. Do. Um, well, I was going to close Discord, so the sound didn't go through, but I need to talk through Discord. That's a valid point. I would uh, turn off your notifications. So. Or just put yourself in stream remote. That'll silence it. Um, doo -doo. let's see. I think the, I can go do. Go down to the user settings and turn yourself in stream remote.
Uh, okay, I think I got it. If it worked, you'd know it would say streamer mode is enabled. Well, um, oh, yes, it does. I Yay, I figured stuff out. Okay, that's helpful. I like it. I love this. I love this background, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. It looks so warm. I should draw like like a little a little cheapy me to put in that chair. You should. I was going to suggest such a thing too. Just draw something of you sitting in the chair <laughs> with a book. That would be perfect. Yeah, I'll I'll have to get to work on that through the week then. Um, but I don't think I quite have the time. Well, for now, we have a story to read. That's true. All right. Okay, everyone. I'm just going to dive right in. Um, anyone who's watching, feel free to talk. I will answer questions and respond and whatever. Um, but, yeah. Um, so, without further ado... I will begin the novel Shipbreaker. A paddle bachigalupi. Naylor had clambered through the service duct, tugging copper wire and yanking it free. Ancient asbestos fibers and mouse grip puffed up around him as the wire tore loose. He scrambled deeper into the duct jerking more wires from its aluminum staples. The staples pinged about the cramped metal passage like coins offered to the scavenger god. And Naylor felt them, and Naylor felt after them eagerly, hunting for their dull gleam and collecting them in a leather bag he kept at his waist. He yanked again at the wiring, a meter's worth of precious copper tore loose in his hands and dust clouds enveloped him. The LED glow paint smeared on Naylor's forehead gave a dim, green, phosphorescent view of the service ducts that made up his world. Grime and, grime and salt sweat stung his eyes and trickled around the edges of his filter mask. With one scarred hand, he swept at the salty rivulets careful to avoid rubbing off the LED paint. The paint itched and drove him crazy, but he didn't relish finding his way back out of the maze-like ducks in blind darkness, blind blackness. So he let his forehead itch and again surveyed his position. Rusty pipes ran ahead of him, disappearing into darkness. Some iron, some steel. Heavy crew would be the ones to deal with that. Mailer only cared about the light stuff. The copper wiring, the aluminum, the nickel, the steel clips that could be sacked and dragged out of the ducts to his light crew waiting outside. Naylor turned to continue down the service passage, but as he did, he banged his head on the duct ceiling. The noise from his collision echoed loud as if, it, as if he were sitting inside a, a Christian church bell. Dust cascaded into his hair. Despite the filter mask, he started coughing as powder leaked in. As powder leaked in around the poorly sealed edges. He sneezed, then sneezed again, eyes watering. He pulled the mask away and wiped his face, then pressed it back over his mouth and nose, willing the stickum to seal, but not holding out much hope. The mask was a hand-me-down given to him by his father. It itched and never sealed quite right because it was the wrong size. But it was all Naylor had. On its side, faded words said, discard after 40 hours of use. But Naylor didn't have another, and no one else did either. He was lucky to have a mask at all, even if the microfibers were beginning to shred 
from repeated scrubbings in the ocean. Sloth, his crew girl, made fun of him whenever he washed the mask, asking why he even bothered. It just made the hellish duck work hotter and more uncomfortable. There was no point, she said. Sometimes he thought she was right. But Pima's mother told him it, and Pima to use the mask no matter what. And for sure, there was a lot of black grime in the filters when he, immer he immersed them in the ocean. That was the black that wasn't in his lungs, Pima's mother said. So he kept on with the mask, even though he felt like he was smothering every time he sucked humid, tropic air through the clogged, breath-wet fibers. A voice echoed down into the duct. You got the wire! Sloth, calling in from where she waited outside. Almost done, Mueller scrambled a little further into the duct, ripping more staples, hurriedly, hurriedly yanking extra copper loose. The duck's passage went on, but he had enough. He slashed the wire free, the serrated back of his work knife. We are good, he shouted. Sloth's acknowledging shout echoed back, clear. The wire whipped away from him, slithering through the crawl spaces, raising dust clouds as it moved. Far down the maze of ducks, Sloth was cranking away at a winding drum, sweat bright on her skin. Blonde hair pasted slick to her face as she, as she sucked the wire out like a rice noodle from a bowl of chin's soup ration. Naylor took his knife and hacked, and hacked Bappy's light crew code above the place where he had clipped the wire. The symbol matched the swirling tattoos on, uh, on Naylor's cheeks, the labor marks that gave him a right to work in the wrecks under Bappy's supervision. Naylor took out a bit of powdered paint, spit on it, mixing it into his palm before smearing it over the mark. Now, even from a distance, the scratches gave off iridescent, an iridescent glow. He used his finger and the remaining paint to write a string of memorized numerals below the symbol LC57-1844. Bappy's permit code. No one else was competing for this stretch right now, but it was good to mark the territory. Naylor gathered the rest of the aluminum staples and scuttled back through the, duct, uh, the ducting on his hands and knees, skirting weak points where the metal wasn't well supported, listening to his own echoes and thumps and ringing taps against the steel as he hustled out, all his senses testing for signs that ducks might break. His little phosphor LED showed the dust, the dust snake slither where the copper cables had gone before him. He crawled over desiccated rat bodies and their nests, even here in the belly of an old oil tanker. There were rats, but these ones had died a long time ago. He crawled over more bones, small ones that came from cats and bits of birds. Feathers and fluff floated in the air. This close to the outside world, the access ducts were a graveyard for all sorts of lost creatures. The head sunlight showed, glaring brightness. Naylor squinted as he clawed toward the light, thinking that this was what rebirth must be like for the life cult. This climbing towards blazing clean sunshine, and then he spilled out of the duct into the hot steel decking. He tore off his mask, gasping. And already I need a bring drink of water. As I can tell, this might be more difficult reading out loud than in my head. Doing fine. <laughs> Bright tropic sunlight and ocean salt breezes bathe him all around. Sledgehammers rang against iron as swarms of men and women clamored over the ancient oil tanker, tearing it apart. Heavy crews peeled away iron panels with acetylene torches. I'm not sure how that's pronounced, actually. And sent them wafting off the sides like palm leaves. Sorry. 
excuse me, like palm leaves crashing on the beach sands below, where more crews drag the scavenge above high tide. Light crews like nailers tore at the ship's small fittings, stripping copper, brass, nickel, aluminum, and stainless steel. Others hunted for hidden petrol and ship oil pockets, bucketing out the valuable fluid. A dance nest of activity, all dedicated to rendering this ex extinct ship's bones into something usable for a new world. Took you long enough, Sloth said. She hammered at the spools, securing clips, releasing it from the winding spindle. Her pale skin gleamed in the sunlight, her own swirling work. Tattoos, almost black against the flesh of her cheeks. Sweat ran down her neck, her blonde hair chopped short, much like his own, to keep from catching the thousands of crevices and whirling bits of machinery that studded their workplace. We are in deep, Naylor said, plenty of service wiring, but it takes a long time to get to it. You always got an excuse. Quit complaining. We'll make quota. We better, Sloth said. Bappy's saying another like Bappy's saying there's another light crew buying scavenge rights. Mailer made a face. Big surprise. Yeah, this was too good to last for long. Give me a hand. Mailer got the other side of the spool and they lifted it from the spindle, grunting. Together they tipped the spool sideways and let it fall to the rusted deck with the clang. Shoulder to shoulder, they leaned into the weight, legs flexing, teeth gritted. The spool slowly began to roll. Nailers' bare feet burned against the sun-blasted blasted decking. The cant of the ship made for hard pushing, but under the combined effort, the, slow, the spool slowly rumbled forward, crunching over blistered preservative paint and loosened metal dark plates. Metal deck plates. From the height of the tanker's deck, bright sands, bright sands beach stretched into the distance. A tarred expanse of sand, puddled seawater littered with scavenged, scavenged bodies of other oil tankers and freighters. Some were completely whole, as if other sea captains had simply decided to steer the kilometer-long ships into the sand and then walk away. Others were flayed and stripped, showing rusty iron girder bones. Hulls lay like chunks of cleaved fish, a conning tower here and there, a crew quarters there, the prow of an oil tanker pointing straight up at the sky. It was as if the scavenge god had come amongst the ships, slashing and chopping, dicing the huge iron vessels into pieces, and then left the corpses scattered carelessly behind. And whatever the, wherever the huge shifts lay, scavenge gangs like nailers swarmed like flies, chewing away at iron meat and bones. Dragging the old world's flesh up from the beach to the scrap wing scales and recycling smelters that burned 24-7 for a profit of Lawson & Carlson, the company that made all the cash from the blood and sweat of the shipbreakers. Naylor and Sloth paused for a moment, breathing hard, leaning against the heavy spool. Naylor wiped the sweat out of his eyes. Far out on the horizon, the, oil, the oily black of the ocean turned blue, reflecting sky and sun. White caps foamed. The air around Naylor was hazed with the black work of, shores, of shoreline smelters. But out there, beyond the smoke, he could see sails. The new clipper ships. Replacements for the massive coal and oil burning wrecks that he and his crew worked to destroy all day long. Gold white sails, carbon fiber hulls, and faster than anything except a maglev train. Naylor's eyes followed a clipper ship as it sliced across the waters, sleek and fast, and completely out of reach. It was possible that. Some of the copper on his spool would eventually sail away on a ship like that. First hauled by train to the Orleans, 
then transfer to a clipper's cargo hole where it would be carried across the ocean to whatever people or country could afford the scavenge. Fappy had a poster of a clipper ship from Libis kind, and I apologize for everything that I mispronounced. Libin Libis kind, Brown and Mohanrash. It connected to his reusable wall calendar and showed a clipper with high altitude parasails extended far above it. Sails that Bappy said could reach the jet streams and yank a clipper across smooth ocean at more than 55 knots, flying above the waves on hydrofoils, tearing through foam and salt water, slicing across the ocean to Africa and India to the Europeans and Nipponese. Naylor stared at the sails hungrily, wondering at the places they went, and whether any of them were better than his own. Naylor, sloth, where the hell have you been? Naylor jerked from his reverie. Pima was waving up at them from the tanker's lower deck, looking annoyed. We're waiting for you, crew boy. Boss girl in the prow, Sloth muttered. Naylor grimaced. Pima was the oldest of them, and it made her bossy. Even his own long friendship with her didn't shelter him from when they were behind quota. He and Sloth turned their attention back to the spool. With another series of grunts, they heaved it over the ship's warped decking and rolled it to where the rudimentary crane had been set up. They hitched the spool to rusted iron hooks, then grabbed the crane cable and jumped aboard the spool as it descended, swaying and spinning to the lower deck. Pima and the rest of the light crew swarmed around them as they hit the bottom. They unclipped the spool and rolled it over to where they set up their stripping operation near the oil tanker's prow. Lengths of discarded insulation from the electrical wire lay everywhere along with the gleaming rolls of copper they had collected, stacked in careful lines and marked with Bappy, Bappy's light crew claim mark, the same swirled symbol that scarred all their cheeks. Everyone started unreeling sections of Naylor's new hull, parting the lengths amongst themselves. They worked quickly, accustomed to one another and the labor. Pima, their boss girl, taller than the rest, and filling out like a woman, black as oil and hard as iron. Sloth, skinny and pale, bones and knots of knees and dirty blonde hair. Hair, The next candidate for duck and scuttle work when Naylor got too big. Her pale skin almost permanently sunburned and peeling. Moon girl, the shade of brown rice, who's... Nail shed mother had died with the last run of malaria, and who worked light crew harder than anyone else because she'd seen the alternative. Her ears and lip her ears and lips and nose decorated with scavenged steel wire that she'd driven through her flesh in the hope that no one would ever want her. No one would ever want her the way they wanted her mother. Tick tock nearsighted, and always squinting at everything around him. Almost as black as Pima, but nowhere near as smart. Fast with his hands as... Fast with his hands as long as you told him what to do with them. And he never got bored. Pearly, the Hindu who told them stories about Shiva and Kali and Krishna, and who was lucky enough to have both mother and father, who worked oil scavenge. Black hair and dark tropic skin, and a hand missing three fingers from an accident with the winding drum. And then there was Naylor. Some people, like Pearlie, knew him, knew who they were and where they came from. Pima knew her mother, came up from the last of the islands across the gulf. Pearlie told everyone who would listen that he was 100% Indian. Hindu... Mawari through and through. Even Sloth said that her people were Irish. Naylor was nothing. Naylor was nothing like that. He had no idea what he was, 
half of something, a quarter of something else. Brown skin and black hair like his dead mother. But with weird, pale blue eyes like his father. Pearly had taken one look at Naylor's pale eyes and claimed he was spawned by demons. But Pearly made things up all the time. He said Pima and Kali were reincarnated, which was why her skin was so black. And why she was... And why she was so damn mean when they were behind quota. Even so, the truth was that Naylor shared his father's eyes and his father's wiry build. And Richard Lopez was a demon for sure. No one could argue that. Sober the man was scary. Drunk, he was a demon. Naylor unwound a section of wire, squatted down on the blazing deck, and crimped the wire with his pliers and ripped off a sleeve of insulation, revealing the shining copper core. Did it again. And again, Hema squatted beside him and with squatted beside him with her own length of wire. Took you long enough to bring out this load. Naylor shrugged. Nothing's close in anymore. I had to go a long way to find it. That's what you always say. You want to go in the hole? You can. I'll go in, Sloth volunteered. Naylor gave her a dirty look. Pearly snorted. You don't have the sense of a half-man. You'd get lost like Jackson Boy, and then we'd get no scavenge at all. Sloth made a sharp gesture. Grind it, Pearly. I never get lost. Even in the dark, when all the ducks look the same. Pearly spat at the edge of the ship, missed, and hit the rail in instead. Cruise on Deep Blue 3, heard Jackson Boy heard Jackson Boy calling out crews on Deep Blue 3 heard Jackson Boy calling out for days couldn't find him though little lice baiter finally just dried up and died bad way to go TikTok commented Thir thirsty in the dark alone shut up you two Moon Girl said you want the dead to hear you calling Pearly shrugged we're just saying Naylor always makes quota. Shit. Sloth ran a hand through her sweaty blonde hair. I get 20 times the scavenge Naylor gets. Naylor laughed. Go on in, then. We'll see if you come out alive. You already filled the spool. Tough grind for you, then. Pima tapped Naylor's shoulders. I'm serious about the scavenge. We had downtime waiting for you. Naylor met Pima's eyes. I make quota. You don't like my work? Then go into yourself. Hema pursed her lips, annoyed. It was an empty suggestion, and they both knew it. She'd gotten too big, and the end had scabs and scars on her spine and elbows, and knees to prove it. Like crudid needed small bodies. Most kids got bounced off, uh, off the crew by the time they hit their mid-teens, even if they starved, them, starved themselves to keep their size down. If Pima weren't such a group, a good crew boss, she'd already be on the, on the beach, hungry and begging for anything that came her way. Instead, she had another year, maybe to bulk up enough to compete against hundreds of others for openings in the heavy crew. But her time was running out, and everyone knew it. Pima said, "You shouldn't be so cocky with, if you're, you sh you wouldn't be so cocky if your dad wasn't such a shipwire." You'd be in the same position as me. Well, that's one thing I can thank him for then. If his father was any indication, Naylor would never be huge. Fast, maybe, but never big. TikTok's dad claimed that none of them would grow that big anyway because the calories they didn't because of the calories they didn't eat. Said that some people up in Seascape, Boston, where were still tall though had plenty of money and plenty of food, never went hungry, got fat and tall. Naylor has, had felt his belly up against his spine enough times that he wondered, that he wondered how it would feel 
to never wake up in the middle of the night with his teeth chewing on his lips, fooling himself into thinking that he was about to eat meat. But it was a stupid fantasy. Seascape Boston sounded a little too much like Christian heaven, or the way the scavenge god promised a life of ease if you could just find the right offering to burn with your body when you went to, this, to his scales. Either way, you had to die to get there. The work went on. Nailer stripped more wire, tossing the junk insulation over the ship's side. The sudden beat down on everyone. Their skins gleamed. Salt, sweat, jewels soaked their hair and dripped into their eyes. Their hands turned slick with, with work, and their crew tattoos shone like intricate knots on their flushed faces. For a little while, they talked and joked, but gradually fell silent, working the rhythm of the scavenge, building piles of copper for whoever was rich enough to afford it. Boss man coming. The warning came up from the waters below. Everyone, everyone hunkered down, looking busy, waiting to see who would appear at the rail. If it was someone else's boss, they could relax. Bobby. Naylor grimaced as their crew boss clambered up on over the rail, huffing, his black hair his black hair gleamed in his pot and his pot belly made it hard for him to climb. But there was money in, but there was money involved, so the bastard managed. Bappy leaned against the rail, regaining his breath, sweat darkened the tank top that he that he wore for work. Yellow and brown stains of whatever curry or sandwich he'd eaten for lunch dotted the material. It made Naylor hungry just looking at all the food on Bappy's chest. But there was no meal coming until evening, and there was no point looking at food Bappy would never share. Bappy's quick brown eyes studied them, alert for signs that they'd gone lazy and weren't serious about scavenging for quota. Even though none of them had been idle before, with Bappy watching, they all worked faster, trying to demonstrate that they were worth keeping. Bappy had been like crew himself once. He knew their ways, knew the tricks of laziness. It made him dangerous. What you got? he asked Pima. Pima glanced up, squinting into the sun. Copper. Lots. Naylor found new ducks that gorgeous crews missed. Bappy's teeth flashed white, showing the front gap where a fight had cost him his insides. How much? Pima jerked her head at Naylor, giving him permission. Maybe a hundred. Hundred and twenty kilos so far, Naylor estimated. There's more down there. Yeah? Bappy nodded. Well, hurry and get it out. Don't worry about stripping it. Just make sure you get it all. Get it all. He looked out towards the horizon. Lawson and Carson says storm's coming. Big one. We're going to be off the wrecks for a couple days. I want enough wire that you can work it on the sand. Naylor stifled his distaste at the thought of going back down into the blackness, but Pappy must have caught something of his expression. Got a problem, Naylor. You think a storm means you can sit on your ass? Bappy waved uh, towards the work camps, strung along the beach's jungle edge. You think I can't get a hundred other life spiders like you, life spiders to take your place? There's kids down there who let me cut out an eye if it would get them uh, up on a wreck. Pima interceded. He's got no problem. You want the wire? We'll get it. No problem. She glared at Naylor. We're your crew, boss. No problem at all. They all nodded emphatically. Naylor got to his feet, handed the rest of his wire over to TikTok. No problem, boss, he repeated. Baffy scowled at Naylor. You sure you vouch for him, Pima? I could put a knife through this one's crew tats and dump him on the sand. He's good scavenge, she said. We're ahead and colder because of him. Yeah? Bappy relented slightly. Well, you're a boss girl. 
I don't interfere. He eyed Naylor. You watch it, boy. I know how you're kind of things. Always imagining you're going to be a lucky strike. Pretending you'll find some big old oil pocket and never work another day in your life. Your old man was a lazy bastard like you. Look how he turned out. Naylor felt a rising anger. I don't talk about your dad. Bappy laughed. What? You gonna fight me, boy? Try and pick stick me from behind the way your old man would. Bappy touched his knife. Huma vouches for you. But I'm wondering if you got the sense to know how much of a favor she's doing. Let it go, Naylor, Hema urged. Your dad's not worth it. Bappy watched, smiling slightly. His hand lingered close to his knife. Bappy had all the cards and they both knew it. Naylor ducked his head and forced down his anger. I'll get your scavenge balls. No problem. Bappy gave Naylor a sharp nod. Smarter than your old man, then. He turned to the rest of the crew. This is not everyone. We don't have a lot of time. You get the extra scavenge out before the storm, I'll bonus you. There's another light crew coming on soon. We don't want to leave them easy, any easy pickings, right? He grinned, Farrell, and they all nodded back. No easy pickings, they echoed. And that's the first chapter. Good stuff so far. How are you feeling? Um, for someone who is usually, you know, not talking a lot, I think I'm doing all right. I agree. And I actually recognize uh, some of the stuff that I'm remembering um, from the other the other book, the one I do not have with me. Um, but I don't know. What do you think of it so far? Very interesting. I like the scavenger appeal and the story and mystery of things that are coming. I think you should keep it up. Okie dokie. All right. So, I don't think this is. Okay. This is a short chapter. I think this is the only short chapter, though, because usually the chapters are much longer. Or I might be re remembering um, uh, The Wind Up Girl, the other book, um, where those chapters are just freaking long. Naylor was farther into the tanker than he'd ever been. No light crew marks gleamed in the darkness. No evidence of any other duct and scuttle workers marred the dust and rat droppings of, this, of the passage. Overhead, three separate lines of copper wire ran ahead of him. A lucky find that meant he might even make Bappy's quota. But Naylor was having a hard time carrying. His mask kept clogging, and in the rush to dive back into the hole, he'd forgotten to renew his LED paint paint patch. Now he had regretted it bitterly, as darkness closed in. He ripped down more tangling wire. The passage seemed to be getting narrower, even as the amount of copper increased. He eased forward, and the duct creaked all around him, protesting his weight. Petroleum fumes burned in his lungs. He wished he could just quit and crawl out. If he turned around now, he could get back on deck in 20 minutes, breathing clean air. But what if he didn't have enough scavenge? Bappy already didn't like him, and Sloth was too damn eager to steal his, his slot. Her words still lingered in his mind. I'll get 20 times the scavenge he does. A warning. He had competition now. It didn't matter that Pima vouched for him. If Naylor failed to pull quota, Bappy would slash out his work tattoos and give, and give Sloth a try. And Pima couldn't do a damn thing about it. 
No one was worth keeping if they didn't make profit. Naylor wriggled around, wriggled onward, driven by Sloth's hungry words. More and more copper came down in his hands. His LED faded to black. He was alone. Nothing but a trail of loosened electrical wire to electrical cable to lead him out. For the first time, he feared he might not be able to find his way. The tanker was huge. One of the workhouses of the, of the oil age. Almost a floating city in itself. And now he was deep in its guts. When Jackson Boy died, no one had been able to find him. They'd heard him banging away on the metal, calling out, but no one could locate a way into the, into the double hole where he had trapped himself. A year later, heavy crews cut open a section of iron, and the little life spider's mummified body had popped out like a pill from a blister pack. Dry like leaves, rattling as it hit the deck. Rat chewed and desiccated. Don't think about it. He'll just bring his ghost onto the ship. The duct was tightening, squeezing around his shoulders. Naylor began to imagine himself stuck like a cork in a bottle, pinned in the darkness, never able to get free. He strained forward and yelled down another length and yanked down another length of the wire. Enough. More than enough. Naylor hacked Bappy's light crew code into the duct's metal with his knife, doing it blind, but at least making a stab at saving the territory for later. He tightened himself into a ball, knees against his chin, elbows and spine scraping against the duct walls as he turned himself around, folding tighter, letting out his breath, fighting off images of corks and bottles, and Jackson Ploy caught in the darkness, dying alone. Tighter, turning listening to the duck creak as he squeezed against the metal. He came free, gasping with relief. In another year, he'd be too big for this work, and Sloth would take his niche for sure. He might be small for his age, but eventually everyone got too big for Light Crew. Naylor squirmed down the duck, rolling the wire ahead of him. The loudest sound was his own rasping breath in the filter mask. He paused and reached ahead, for the loosened wire confirming that it was still there, still leading him out to the light. Don't panic. You took this wire down yourself. You just need to keep following it. A scuttling noise echoed behind him. Naylor froze, skin crawling. A rat, probably. It just sounded big, unbidden. Another image intruded. Jackson boy. Nayla could imagine the dead crew boy's ghost in the ducks with him, creeping through the darkness, stalking him, reaching for his ankles with dry bone fingers. Nayla fought down panic. It was just superstition. Paranoia. Paranoia was for Moon Girl, not for him. But the fear was in him now. He started shoving his scavenged wire aside, suddenly desperate for clean air and light. He'd crawl out, renew his LED paint, then come back when he could see what what was what. Screw Sloth and Pappy. He needed air. Naylor started squeezing around his tangled bundle of copper. The duct creaked dangerously as, as he squirmed past, protesting the collected weight of himself and the wire. Stupid to gather so much. Should have cut it in sections and let Pima and Sloth spool it out. But he'd been hurrying, and now of all things he collected too much. Naylor crawled forward, jamming the wire aside. Felt a flush of triumph as he kicked the, the last tangling wires off his legs. The duct groaned loudly and shuddered under him. Naylor froze. All around, the duct pinged and creaked. It sank slightly, tilting. The whole thing was on the verge of collapse. Naylor's frantic activity and extra weight weakened it. Naylor spread out his weight and lay still, heart pounding, trying to sense the duck's intentions. The metal went quiet. Naylor waited, listening. Finally, he eased forward, delicately shifting his weight. Metal shrieked. 
The duct dropped out from under him. Naylor scrambled for footholds on it as his world ga as his world gave way. His fingers seized scavenge wire. For a second, it held suspended above an infinite pit, where the wire tore loose. He plummeted. I don't want to be like Jackson Boy. I don't want to be a Jackson Boy. I don't. He hit liquid, warm and viscous. Blackness swallowed him with barely a ripple. That was that short chapter. Yes. I'm getting... I think Twitch hiccuped. It did. I had to fix a connection. There were strangely a lot of drop frames. But everybody just Ooh. refresh to fix. I'm recording this too, so there's not an interruption for. Okay. Or it'll immediately start dropping frames again. What the hell? Uh, it seems fine on my end. It just keeps telling me it's dropping frames. All right, I'll just ignore it. I'll just ignore it. <clears throat> keeps telling me frames drop. Fine on your end. Um, well, the only movement I really have is the, is the fire, but. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, it's very hard to tell and there's not a whole lot going on. So I'm not sure <laughs> that the connection isn't. Oh, I'll refresh again just to be sure. Yeah, okay. All right. I don't know if it cut me off at some point, but hey, no, it happened right at the end of your chapter. Read. Yeah. So, brief recap. He fell into something. Swim, you bastard! Swim, you bastard! Swim, you bastard! Swim. Nailer sank like a. Sank like a stone through warm, reeking liquid. It was like trying to swim through thick air instead of water. No matter how hard he fought, the warmth gave way under him, sucking him deeper. Why can't I swim? He was a good swimmer. He had never worried about drowning in the ocean, even, even in heavy sw surf. But now he kept sinking, his hand tangled in something solid. The copper wire. He grabbed for it, hoping it was still connected to the ducks above. It slithered through his fingers, slick and slimy. Oil. Naylor fought off the panic, but it was impossible to swim in oil. It just swallowed you like quicksand. He clawed again for the for the copper and looped the wiring around his hand to to counteract its slickness. His sinking stopped. He began hauling himself back out of the muck. His lungs screamed for air. Hand over hand, he dragged himself higher. He fought the urge to breathe, to give, to give up and fill his lungs with oil. It would be so easy. He came out of the oil like a whale surfacing oil, oil sheeting off his face. He opened his mouth to breathe. Nothing, just a strange pressure on his face. The mask. Naylor tore it off, gasping. Sucked air. Petroleum vapors burned his lungs, but he could breathe. He used the mask clean interior to scrape at his eyes, clearing oil away. He opened them to an intense stinging and burning. Tears filled his eyes. He blinked rapidly. Blackness all around. Pitch blackness. He was in some kind of oil reservoir. Maybe a leaked oil pool or some secondary storage chamber or 
he had no idea where in the ship he where he was in the ship. If he was really unlucky, he was in one of the main oil wars. He finished wiping his eyes and tossed and tossed away the now useless mask. The fumes were dizzying. He forced himself to breathe shallowly as he clung to the wire. His skin burned with its petroleum coating. Hammers rang faintly in the distance, workers banging away at the ship, all unaware of this emergency. His hand started to slide off the wire. Naylor grabbed desperately for a better handhold, hooking his arm through the tangle. Overhead, the duct creaked alarmingly. A, a tingle of fear ran through him. A few strands of wire that stretched the high overhead duct were all that kept him from drowning. But the safety was temporary. Soon the duct would give away and he'd sink again, his lungs filling with oil, thrashing and gurgling. Calm down, you idiot. Naylor considered trying to swim again, but discarded that idea. It was just his mind playing tricks, fantasizing that the liquid all around was actually water. But oil was different. It didn't support a body, no matter how much you wished. It just swallowed you up. Naylor had seen a man on heavy crew drown that way. He thrashed briefly in the oil, shouting in panic, then slipped under, long before anyone could throw him a rope. Don't panic. Think. Naylor reached out, fingers straining into the blackness, reaching for anything. A wall, some bit of floating junk, anything to tell him where he was. His hand found nothing but air and murky oil and mucky oil. His movements made the duck creak overhead. The wire sank slightly as something gave way. Naylor had his breath, held his breath, expecting to go under. But the wire stopped sinking. Pima, he shouted. His voice echoed back, fast bouncing all around. Naylor clutched the wire, surprised. Judging from the sound, he wasn't in as big a place as he, as he thought. There were walls nearby. Pima! Again, the fast echo. There wasn't some giant, this wasn't some giant oil tank. It was much, much smaller. Heartened by the impression of walls, Naylor reached out again, but this time, instead of using his hand, he stretched out into the darkness with his toes. After two tries, rough metal met his skin, a wall of some sort, and something else. Naylor sucked in a grateful breath. A thin pipe running along its along its breadth. It was only a centimeter in diameter, but still it had to be better than tangled copper dangling from a failing duct. Without waiting to reconsider, Naylor lunged for the wall. As he moved, the ducting overhead shrieked and gave way. Naylor sank, thrashing and scrambling for the thin pipe. His slick hands touched a wall, slipped off, caught. He dragged himself up against the wall, clinging by his fingertips. They trembled with the strain. The oil didn't give him any float at all. Already he was tiring. He couldn't support himself for long. Quickly, Naylor slid along the wall, seeking better handholds. If he was lucky, maybe there was a ladder. He reached a bend in the pipe. It turned sharply downward and disappeared into the oil. Naylor stifled his up frustration. He was going to die. Don't panic. If he started crying, he was screwed. He needed to think. Not all like a baby, but already his mind felt drunk and scattered. The fumes were overwhelming. Naylor could see how this would end. He'd hang on for a little longer, inhaling more and more poisonous air, clinging on like a bug to the wall. But eventually he'd get too tired and high and he'd slip off. How could he die in such a stupid way? This wasn't even a storage tank, just some room full of pooled waste oil. It was a joke, really. Lucky Strike had found an oil pocket on his ship and, and bought his way free. Naylor had found one, had found one and it was going to kill him. I'm going to drown in goddamn money.
Miller almost laughed at the thought. No one knew exactly how much oil Lucky Strike had found and smuggled out. The man had done it slow over time, sneaking it out bucket by bucket until he had enough to buy out his indenture and burn off his work tattoos. But he had enough left over to set him up as a labor broker selling slots into the into the heavy crews that he had es escaped. Just a little oil just a little oil had done so much for Lucky Strike, and Naylor was up to his neck in the damn stuff. Naylor The voice was faint, far away. Sloth Naylor's voice cracked with the relief. I'm here, down here. I fell through. He kicked in his excitement, and the oil rippled around him. A bit of green light illuminated the gloom of love. Sloth's scavenge features peered through the duct hole, an LED smear on his forehead. Damn, you screwed big time, Naylor. She, you screwed big time, Naylor? She asked. Yeah, big time screwed. He grinned weakly. Bima sent me in for you. Tell her I need rope. A long pause. Bobby won't do it. Why? Another long silence. He wants copper. Sent me in for copper before the storm comes. Just drop me a rope. Gotta make quota. Her glow face disappeared. Pima sent stuff. Pima sent stuff in ca case I found you. In case you needed help. Nila grimaced. You see a ladder? You see a ladder anywhere? Another long pause as they both peered at the groom with her phosphor green paint lighting. Nothing. No ladders. No doors, just a rusty room filled with black murk. What's wrong with you? Sloth asked. You broke something? Nala shook his head before he remembered she probably couldn't see him well. I'm swimming in oil. You tell Bappy I'm up to my neck in oil. Thousands of gallons. It's worth his while to get me out. There's a lot of oil for him here. Another pause. Yeah? A lot? Naylor realized with a chill that Sly Salt Sloth was calculating the advantages. Don't think you can do a lucky strike, he called up. Lucky strike did it, she responded. We are crew, Naylor said, trying to keep his voice from showing fear. You tell Pima there's oil. You tell you tell her there's a secret stash. If you don't, I'll haunt you like Jackson Boy and come back and gut you while you're sleeping. Silence. Sloth. Thinking. Naylor felt a sudden wash of hatred for her. The skinny, starved girl perched up there had all the power in the world to help or kill. To tell Bappy, at least there was something to be gained from Naylor's survival. And yet, there she sat. He called up, Sloth! Shut up, she said. I'm thinking. We're crew, he reminded her. We swore blood out. But he knew the calculations she was making. Her clever mind working the angles, sensing the great pool of wealth, the secret stash that she might pillage later if fates and the rust saint worked in her favor. He wanted to scream at her, to grab her and drag her down. Teach her what it felt like to die sucking oil. But he couldn't yell at her, couldn't piss her off. He needed her, needed to convince her to help him survive. We'll keep it secret, he offered. We can lucky strike together. Another pause. Then she said, You said yourself, you're swimming in it. Soon as anyone sees you, they, they know you'll found a pocket. He grimaced. Too damn smart. That was the problem with girls like Sloth. Too damn smart for his own good. We are crew, he said again, but he suspected it was pointless. He knew her too well. Knew all of them too well. They'd all starve. They'd all talk about what they'd do if they ever found a lucky strike. And here, Sloth had been given one. Chances like this didn't come along. 
Sloth had to make her gamble. It was her chance. Please, he prayed. Please let her be good like Pima. Please, Pima and her, please, like Pima and her mom. Please let her not be like Dad. Bates, please don't let her be like Dad. Sloth interrupted his whispered prayers. Pima says I'm supposed to hook you up good if I find you. You found me. Yeah, that's for sure. A rustling. Here's food and water. A shadow fell through the green glow of her forehead. Phosphor. It hit with a splash. Now I could see pale objects floating in the surface, starting to sink. He stressed for them, trying to keep his hand on the wall. Managed to snag a water bottle before it disappeared. Everything else was already gone. The blackness of the room closed in on him again as Sloth disappeared. Thanks for nothing, shouted after her. But she was already gone. He had no idea if Sloth would actually report to Pima or if she'd just hurry back, dragging Copper, determined to replace him and think of some way to claim the oil prize all to herself. For certain, she wouldn't tell Bappy. Bappy would just call it Light Crew Scavenge to keep it for himself. That meant they had hours more copper work to prepare for the storm. And that meant he had hours to wait, even if Pima knew where he, where he was and that he needed help. With one slippery hand, his, and with one slippery hand in his teeth, Naylor managed to open the plastic bottle and drink while he clung to the wall. He swished, he swished with the first mouthful and spat it out, trying to clear the oil and gunk from his mouth, and then drink hard and fast, gulping, grateful, unaware, into the water, until the water was pouring into him how thirsty he had been. He swallowed the rest greedily, then set the bottle floating in the blackness. If he died... This would be the last thing of him on the surface. A few scrambling sounds dif drifted down from above, scraping and tearing. Sloth! The sound stopped and started again. Come on, Sloth, help me out! He didn't know why he'd bother. She had made her decision. As far as she was concerned, he was already a corpse. His fingers weakened. The oil crept up around his chin. Fates, he was tired. He wondered if Jackson Boy had also been betrayed by his crew, if that was why the Lice Spider hadn't been found until a year later. Maybe someone had let him die on purpose. You're not going to die. But he was lying to himself. He was going to drown without a ladder or a door, Miller's heart suddenly beat faster. If this was some room accidentally filled with oil, then there had to be doors. But they'd all be down below the surface. He'd have to dive down and risk not making it up. Dangerous. You'll, you'll drown anyway. Sloth's not going to save you. That was the real truth. He could hang on for a little longer, getting weaker and weaker, but eventually his fingers would fail and he'd slip off. You're dead already. It was a curiously liberating thought. He really had nothing to lose. Naylor slid slowly along the wall, questing down into the into the murk with his toes, feeling for some bump or ledge that would tell him a door lay below. The first time he found nothing. But the second, he let himself sink lower, oil lapping out around his jaw. His toes brushed something. He tilted his nose to the sky, letting the oil lap up higher around his cheeks, closing around his mouth and nose, a ledge, a rim of metal. Naylor ran his toe, his toe along the way. He could, it could be the top of a doorway, he guessed. It wasn't much more than three feet wide. The ledge itself was a boon. He could almost rest, letting his toes cling to it, taking some of the pressure off his trembling fingers. 
The ledge felt like a palace. You can rest now, he thought. You can wait for Pima. Sloth will tell her you're down here. You can wait it out. He killed the hope. Maybe Pina, Pima would come save him. Probably, though, Sloth wouldn't say anything about him. He was on his own. Naylor balanced on the, led, on the ledge on the edge of a decision. Live or die, he thought. Live or die. And he dove. Okia. Okia. Need another drink. Take another drink. It is at this time I am uh, suddenly more appreciative of my um, of whenever my parents, my mom read me a book when I was a kid. Yeah, parents go through a lot. <laughs> Usually they hope you fall asleep before you get this far. That is fair. Uh, all right, next one's not long. I like how some of these chapters are a little longer and others are shorter. Um, the... Uh, the one I had intended to read before, I think I'd only be able to do like one or two chapters at a time because then it's because they're just so damn long and the words are so damn complicated. Okay. In a way, the black muck of the oil was no worse than the blackness of the Naylor let his hands do the work of seeing. He quested down along the rim of the door, sinking deeper. Reading its outline, his, an his hands touched a wheel lock. Naylor's heart surged with relief. The wheel was the was the kind used to hold back a, hold back seawater. If a hole if a hole breached, a solid airtight door. He tugged at the wheel, trying to remember which way to turn it. It didn't budge. He fought down panic, yanked on the wheel again. Nothing. It wouldn't move, and he was running out of air. Naylor kicked for the surface, using the wheel to launch himself upward, praying that he'd make it. He surfaced, flailing. His fingers scrambled for a thin pipe, miraculously caught hold before he sank again. He wiped frantically at his face, clearing his nose and keeping his eyes shut. He blew air through his lips, pushing oil away from his mouth, sucked in a fume-laden breath. With his eyes still closed, he felt again for the door frame with his toes. He thought he lost it for a second, but then he scraped rust, and for a moment later, he was perched again. He smiled tightly. A door with a wheel. A chance. If he could make the damn thing turn. More scrambling echoed above. Sloth at work still. He called up to her. Hey, Sloth! I got me a way out. I'm coming for you, crew girl. The movement stopped. You hear me? His voice echoed all around. I'm getting out, and I'm coming for you. Yeah, Sloth responded. You want me to go get Pima? Mockery laced her voice. Naylor again wished he could reach up and yank her down at the oil. Instead, instead, Naylor made his voice reasonable. If you go get Pima now, I'll forget you were trying to go. I'll forget you were going to let me drown. A long pause. Finally, Sloth said, It's too late, right? She went on. I know you, Naylor. You'll tell Pima no matter what. Then I'm off crew and someone else buys in. Another pause and then she said, It's all fate now. If you got a way out, I'll see you on the outside. You'll get your revenge then. Naylor scowled. It had been worth a try. He thought about the door, waiting below him. It might be locked from the far side. Maybe that's why the wheel didn't turn. Maybe. If it's locked, you die, same as everything. No use worrying about it. He took a deep breath, went down again. 
this time with more air knowing that he was trying knowing what he was trying to do he found the wheel quickly and then took his time working working it he braced his feet on the hatch frame felt around for the latch handle first he needed to first he needed to un, unseal with the wheel then he needed to yank the handle he tried to turn the wheel again nothing he leaned against it bracing himself sideways and using his legs fighting to keep a grip nothing he hooked his elbow through the wheel he was running out of air but he didn't want to give up he pulled pulled again harder the wheel digging into the crook of his arm his lungs were bursting the wheel turned. Naylor redoubled his efforts. Gold and blue and red pulses filled his vision. The wheel turned again, loosening. He was frantic for air, but he stayed down, fighting the urge to kick for the surface, turning the wheel faster and faster until his lungs were heaving. He launched himself upward again, hope running wild as he surfaced. Eager now, he hyperventilated a final time. Huffing, huffing high in the blackness, dove, spinning, spinning, spinning the wheel, his lungs bursting all, all or nothing, reckless with the need to get out. Nailer, Nailer linked, yanked the latch handle. For a second, he worried, worried that the door swung inward and he would never be able to drag the thing open against the pressure of the oil holding it closed. The door blew open. Naylor was sucked in, sucked in a black torrent. He slammed into a wall, wall, curled into a ball as he tumbled. Oil roared around him. His forehead smashed against metal and he almost took a breath but forced himself to curl tighter, letting himself be turned, turned and swirled and bounced and slammed through ship corridors like a jellyfish thrown by breakers into a reef. He blasted into open air. Naylor's stomach dropped out, out of him, free fall, involuntary. His eyes opened, stinging oils and scalding sun. A mere bright ocean, almost white with its intensity. Blue waves rushed up to meet him. He had only a second to twist. He smashed into the water. Sea salt swallowed him. The surge and swell of an oily sea. The roll of breakers. Nail surged upward, kicking for the surface. Broke out into sunlight and waves, gasping. He sucked air, flooding his lungs with shining, clean oxygen, starved for all the life he had, he had been sure he had lost. Above him, a tear in the oil tanker's holes, holes still spewed with oil, marking where the ship had vomited him, had vomited him into open air. Black streams of crude traced down from the ship's hide, running in sick li slick rivulets 50 feet of a fall into shallow water, and he was alive. Naylor started to laugh. I'm alive, he shouted, and then he was screaming feeling the flood of victory and released terror, drunk on sunshine and waves and the people staring at him from the shore. He swam for the beach, still laughing, drunk on survival. Waves caught him. Waves caught him and pushed him into the shore. He realized that he had been doubly lucky. If the tide hadn't come in, he would have slammed against the sand instead of plunging into the water. Naylor crawled out of the breakers and stood. His legs were weak from so long swimming. But he was standing on dry land, and he was alive. He laughed madly at Bappy and Lee and Rain and the hundreds of other laborers and crew gangs, all of them staring at him dumbstruck. I'm alive, he shouted at them. I'm alive! They all said nothing, simply stared. Naylor was about to shout again, but something in their faces made him look down. 
Sea foam lapped around his ankles, rust and bits of wire, shells and insulation, and intermixed with the ocean froth, his blood, running down his legs in streams, bright and red and steady, straining the waters with the pounding of his heart. And I need to take a break. All right, sounds like a good break point. Doing well, though. Hmm, this is exercise. 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 I actually ended up getting uh, a lot of inspiration and things from uh, books like these. Yeah, these kind of books are good shaping that event. I am uh, going to be right back. Okay.
I got cookies. Hey, Rez, you watching? It's here. It's two. Hi, Rez and Morph. I saw we had six people at one point. Hey, a couple of people peeked. I think the pickup on the internet lost a few. Oh, that sucks. Whenever you're ready to How are you enjoying it? How is everyone enjoying it? You roboted for a second. Check your connection. I will do so. Oh, now it's better. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, as long as it's better. Um, no, this is very interesting. Ah, uh, just wait till you meet the dog people. Or dog, dog person. People. There's a dog people! Good boy. They are good boys, and I love them. Actually, um, one of my favorite characters in this universe is the dog person. And it's actually in this book, and it makes me so happy. I forget what his name is, though. It's been a while since I've read this. I've forgotten most of their names. Just remembered the story. Neat. Wow, this is so long. It's actually not that long. But... Um, if I remember right, there's, there's, uh, there's, like, things that happen, like, at the beginning, or close to the beginning, that pop up again, like, right around the end, and then you're like, ah, that's great, but I can't spoil it. Um... But yeah, the um, what was the company Jackson and Carl or whatever? Um, that's like like the a big calorie company or something. Because mm. everything's like different in this world. Uh, like they have those like ships that like send sails like up into the stratosphere or something, and it just pulls them. Maybe not that high, but um, then there's the other the other book I was gonna read was was took place in Bangkok. Anywho. Anywho. I can get back into it. So grab your mugs of warm root beer, sit down by the fire, and enjoy. You're lucky, Pima's mother said. You should be dead. Miller was almost too tired to respond, but he mustered a grin for the occasion. But I'm not. I'm alive. Pima's mother picked up a blade of rusted metal and held it in front of his face. If this was even another inch into you, you would have washed onto the shore as body scavenge. Sadna regarded him seriously. You're lucky. The fates were holding you close today. Should you have been another Jackson? She, offer, she offered him the rusty shiv. Keep that for talisman. It wanted you. It was going for you long. Miller reached for the metal that had almost cut him down and winced as his stitches pulled. You see, she said, you're blessed today. Fates love you. Naylor shook his head. 
I don't believe in fates. But he said it quietly, low enough that she wouldn't hear. If fates existed, they'd put him with his dead. And that meant they were bad news. Better to think... Better to think life was random than to think that, than to think the world was out to get you. Fates were all right if you were Pima or got lucky with a good mom and a, and a dad who was nice enough to have died before he could start beating you. But the rest of the time, watch out. Pima's mother looked up, her dark brown eyes studying, studying him. Then you get then you get right with whatever gods you worship. I don't care if it's that elephant headed Ganesha or Jesus Christ or the Rust Saint or your dead mother, but someone was looking after you. Don't spit on that gift. Naylor nodded obediently. Pima's mother was the best thing he had going. He didn't want to take her off. Her shack of plastic tarps and old boards and scavenged palm was the safest place he knew. Here he could always count. Here he could always count on shared crawdads or rice, or even on days where, when there was nothing to eat. Well, there was certainly. Well, there was still, the certainty. That within these walls, under the blue dangling fate's eyes and mottled statue of the rust saint, no one would try to cut him or fight him or steal from him. Here, fear and, fear and tension fell away in the presence of sadness strength. Naylor moved gingerly, testing the stitching and cleaning and cleaning work she'd done. Feels good, Sadna. Thanks for patching me. I hope it does you some good. She didn't look up. She was washing the stainless steel knives in the bucket of water, and the water had turned red with her work. You're young. You're not addicted to anything. And say what you like about your father. You've got that Lopez tenacity. You have a chance. You think I'll get an infection? Emma's mother shrugged, her corded muscles rippling under her tank. Her black skin gleamed in the candlelight of her shack. She'd left her own crew and shift to make sure that he'd be cleaned up. Dropped a quota, uh, dropped a quota thanks to Pima, who had who had had the sense to run for her. She heard that her missing crew boy was down in the shadows instead of up in the ship. I'm not sure, Naylor, she said. You took a lot of cuts. Skin's supposed to protect you, but water's dirty here, and you were in oil. She shook her head. I'm not a doctor. He he made a joke of it. I don't need a doctor. I just need a needle and thread. Patch me up like a snail. Like a sail. I'm good as new. She didn't smile. Keep this clean. If you get a fever or skin starts to pus, try me. We'll put maggots on it and see if that will help. Naylor made a face, but he nodded at her fierce glare and gingerly sat up. He put his feet down on the floor, watching as Sadna bustled around the single room, carrying his blood water out into the dark, then coming back. He straightened and carefully made his way to the door. He pushed the plastic scavenge door aside so that he could see down onto the beach. Even at night, the wrecks glowed in the dark uh, with work, people lab laboring by torchlight as they continued the steady job of disassembly. The ships showed as huge black shadows against the bright star points and the surge of the Milky Way above. The torchlights flickered, bobbing and moving. Sledge, rang, sledge noise rang across the water, comforting sounds of work and activity. The air tanked with the coal and reek of smelters in the sea and the salt, fresh breeze coming off the water. It was beautiful. Before almost dying, he hadn't known it, but now that he was out, Bright Sands Beach was the best thing he had ever seen. He couldn't stop looking at it all. 
and it stopped smiling at the people walking along the sand at the at the cook fires where people roasted tilapia they'd hooked in the shallows at the jangle of music or the shout of a of or the sh- or the shout of drinking from the nail sheds it was all beautiful almost as beautiful as the sight sight of sloth getting kicked down the beach her eyes wet with tears for herself while he was getting stitched up Baffy had put a knife through her through her light crew tattoos himself, disowning her completely. She'd never work as a shipbreaker again, and probably nowhere else either. Sucks to be not, her. Yeah. Not after breaking blood oaths. She had been proven that no one could trust her. Uh yeah. That's 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 what that's what betrayal gets you. Um, Naylor had been surprised that Sloth hadn't. He wasn't about to forgive, but he respected that she hadn't begged or tried to apologize when Bappy got out his knife. Everyone knew the score. What was done was done. She gambled and lost. Life was like that. There were lucky strikes, and there were Sloths. There were Jackson boys, and there were lucky bastards like him. Different sides of the same coin. You tossed your luck into the air, and it rattled down the gambling boards, and you either lived or died. It's the fates, Pima's mother muttered. They've taken you now. No telling what they'll do with you. She was staring at him with an expression that almost looked like sadness. He wanted to ask her what she meant, but Pima came in through the door with the rest of the crew. Hey, hey, Pima said. Looking at our crew boy, she inspected his pucker wounds and stitches. You get some nice scars out here, Naylor. Lucky scars, Moon said Moon Girl. Even better than tattoo of the Rust Saint's face. She handed him a bottle. What's this? Naylor asked. Moon Girl shrugged. Luck gift. God's got you tight now. I'm getting close to God. Naylor smiled and sipped. Was surprised by the quality of alcohol that burned in his mouth. Pima laughed. It's Black Ling. She leaned close. TikTok stole it. Crazy Light Spider just walked, walked out of Chin's noodle shack with it. He's got no sense. But he's got fast hands. She pulled him towards, uh, toward the shore. We got a fire going. Let's get drunk. What about work tomorrow? Bobby says storm's coming in for sure, she grinned. We can strip wire with a hangover, no problem. The crew gathered around the bonfire, swapping drinks. Pima went away, went away and came back after a little, a little while later with a pot of rice and beans. And then surprised Naylor again with a stick of grilled pigeon. At his look of surprise, she said, Other people want to get close to close to God and the fates. People saw you come out of that ship. No one gets luck like that. He didn't question any more, but ate greedily, glad to be alive and eating so well. They drank, passing around the rusty uh, the rusty shiv that had nearly killed them. Considered the possibilities of turning it into a talisman. A decoration to hang around his neck. The buzz of alcohol warmed him. Made the world seem even better than before. He was alive. His skin sang with life. Even the pain in his back and shoulder where the shiv had nearly uh, nearly driven him, driven into him felt good. Being close to death had made everything in his life shine. He rolled his shoulder, savoring the pain. Pima watched him across the firelight. You think he can crew tomorrow? Naylor made himself nod. It's just dripping wire. Who are we getting for Scuttle Duck? Moon Girl asked. Pima grimaced. Thought it was going to be Sloth. Got to swear, got to swear in someone new to replace her. Get bloody with someone. A lot of good that does, TikTok muttered. Yeah, well, some people still keep their word. They all looked down the beach to where Sloth had been dumped. 
she'd be hungry soon and needing someone to protect her. Someone to share scavenge with, to, to cover her back when she couldn't work. The beach was a hard place to survive without crew. Naylor stared, stared at the bonfires, thinking about the nature of love. One quick decision by Sloth, and everything about her future was decided. She didn't have many options now, and all of them were ugly, full of blood and pain and desperation. He took another swig from the bottling, wondering if he pitied her despite what she had done. We could bring Teela on, Pearlie suggested. She's small. She's got a club foot, the girl said. How fast can she move? For that crew, she'd hustle. I'll decide later, Pima said. Maybe Naylor heals quick and we don't need a scuttle duct replacement. Naylor smiled sourly. Or maybe Bout, Bobby cuts me out and sells my slot. Then none of us get to choose. Not over my head. No one said anything. It was too good a night to spoil with bad speculation. Happy would do whatever he wanted, but they didn't need to pick that scab tonight. Pima seemed to sense their doubts. I talked to Bappy already, she, she insisted. Naylor's got a couple of days free on the boss's man's quota. Even Bappy wants to get close to luck like this. He's not pissed that I lost crude to the, uh, to the other crews. Well, that too, but the wire came out with you. So he's happy about that. You've got your heel time. Russ Saint's my witness. It almost sounded good enough to believe. Naylor took another drink. He'd seen enough adult promises turn out to just be wishes that he wasn't going to hold his breath, though. He needed to be crewing tomorrow, and he needed to look useful fast. He carefully worked his shoulder, willing it to get better. A couple days wire stripping would be a blessing if anything out of this whole mess was lucky. It was that a storm was coming. Then again, without the storm, he wouldn't have been back in the hole twice in the same day. Naylor drank again, enjoying the view of the beach. In the night, you couldn't even, you couldn't even see the oil slicks on the water. Just the liquid silver reflection from the moon. Far out on the distant water, a few red and green lights glowed like fairy fire. The running lights of clipper ships crossing the gulf. The sailing ships slid silently across the horizon. Blown so fast that their lights disappeared over the curve of earth within it. He tried to imagine standing on the deck of one of those ships, leaving the beach and the crew behind, sailing free and fast. Pima took the booze bottle from him. Daydreaming? Nightdreaming. Mailer nodded out of the colored lights. You ever sail on one? A clipper? Pima shook her head. No way. Saw one dock once. They had a whole bunch of half men for guards. Wouldn't let beach trash trash paddle close, she grimaced. The dog faces put electricity in the water. Tick-tock laughed. I remember that. Tried to swim out and started tingling all over. Pima scowled, and... And... Then we had to drag you back like a dead fish. Almost got us all zapped. That would have been fine. Moon girl snorted. The dog faces would have eaten you alive. That's how they do. Don't even cook their meat. Those monsters always tear, tear and raw. If we left you out there, they'd have been using your ribs for toothpicks. Grind that. There's half men who, who there's half men who muscles for Lucky Strike. What? What's its name? TikTok halted briefly, stimmied. Anyway. I've seen it. It's got big damn teeth. And it don't eat people. But it don't eat people. How would you know? The, one, the ones it eats aren't around, aren't around a bitch anymore. Goats, Pima said suddenly. The half man eats goats. When he first showed, showed up on the beach, 
they paid him goats to work heavy crew. My mom told me he could eat a whole goat in three days. She made a face. Moon Girl's right. You don't want to tangle with those monsters. You never know when their animal side will try to take your arm off. Naylor was still watching the lights out in the, out in the deeps. You ever wonder what it would be like to ride a clipper? Get out on one of those things. I don't know. Pima shook her head. Fast, I guess. Damn fast, Moon Girl supplied. Red Rip fast, Pearly said. They were all looking out to the water now. Hungry. You think they even know we're here? Moon Girl asked. Pima spat in the sand. We're just flies and garbage to people like that. The lights kept moving. Naylor tried to imagine what it would be like to stand on on deck, hurtling across the waves, blasting through spray. spray. He spent evenings staring at images of clippers under sail, pictures that he had stolen from magazines that Bappy had kept in a drawer in his supervisor's de- shack. But that was as close as he had ever gotten. He had spent hours poring over those sleek predat- predator Tory line studying the sails, the hydrofoils, the smooth engineered surfaces so different from the rusting wrecks he worked every day. Staring at the beautiful people who smile and drink on decks. The ships whispered promises as feed and salt air and open horizons. Sometimes Naylor wished he could simply step through the pages and escape onto the prow of a clipper. Sailing away his imagination from the daily mangle of ship-breaking life. Other times, he tore the pictures up and threw them away, hating that they made him hungry for things he hadn't known he'd wanted until he'd seen the sails. The wind shifted. A black cloud of smelting smoke blew over the beach, enveloping them in, the hush- in, in, in haze and ash. Everyone started coughing and choking, trying to get some clean air. The wind shifted again, but Naylor kept coughing. This time, and his time in the oil room had hurt him. His chest and lungs felt tender, and the taste of oil lingered in his mouth. By the time Naylor looked up from his coughing, clipper ships were gone. More smelting, smelting smoke blew across the campfire. Naylor smiled, smiled bitterly in the acrid wind. That was what thinking about clipper ships got you. A lung full of smoke because you weren't paying attention to what was around. He took another swig from his bottle and passed it to Pearlie. Thanks for the luck gift, he said. Never knew Black Lean was so damn fine. Moon Girl smiled. Damn fine drink for a damn fine bastard. He's lucky, all right, Pima said. Luckiest bastard I've ever saw. She inspected the other luck offerings that had accumulated over the night. Another stick of pigeon that Naylor offered to the group. A pack of hand-rolled cigarettes, a bottle of cheap liquor from Jim Thompson Still, a thick silver earring, wide board, a sea-polished shell, a half-kilo sack of rice. Luckier than Lucky Strike, Naylor teased. Not after you lost all that oil, Moon Girl said. If you were Lucky Strike, you'd have figured out how to sneak it out without wasting it. Be a rich man now, owning the beach. The others grunted agreement, but Pima had gone still, her black skin a shadow. No one's that lucky, she said bitterly. Everyone's daydreaming about being the next Lucky Strike is what made Sloth go bad. Yeah, well, Naylor shrugged. I still feel lucky today. Pima made a face. You weren't just lucky, she said. You were smart. And Lucky Strike, he was smart too. Half the crews out here find some catch of oil or copper or whatever. None of them figure out what to do with it. Crew balls grabs it in the end. And they get bumped off the wrecks. Sh- and they get bumped off the wrecks. Shit. She took another swig from the bottle wiped her lips on on her arm before passing it to Moon Girl, who drank and coughed. Luck isn't what you need out here, Pima said. Smarts is what you need. Luck or smarts, I don't care, 
long as I'm not dead. Cheers to that. Still, we get excited about being like Lucky Strike and we lose our heads. We waste all our money throwing dice trying to get close to luck. Trying to get the big win. We pray to the Rust Saint to help us find something we can keep for ourselves. Hell, even my mom puts good rice on the scavenge god scale for a luck offering. And we just end, and we just end up like sloth. Hema nodded down the beach to where men from the heavy crew started their bonfires. Nail shed girls were with them, laughing and teasing them, twining slender arms around the men's waist, urging them to drink and spend. Sloth's down there now. I saw her. Dreaming about a lucky strike, got her nothing except shame cuts through, through her crew tattoos and a whole lot of bad company. Naylor, Naylor studied the men's bonfires. Think she'll come after me? I would, Pima said. She's got nothing to lose now. She nodded at Naylor's luck gifts. You better find a good place to stash all that. She'll probably try to steal it. Maybe she finds some sugar daddy down there to take her under his wing. But no one else is going to deal with her. Grub shacks won't take her because she's because the shipbreakers won't buy anything from someone who's slashed crew tats. Smelter clans definitely won't touch an earthbreaker. Liar like that, she's out of options. Moon Girl said she could sell off a kidney, maybe tap out a couple pints of blood for the harvesters. They're always buying. Sure. She's got those pretty eyes, Pearlie said. Harvesters would take those in a second. Pima shrugged. Medical buyers can slice and dice her like, uh, like a side of pork, but after a while, everyone runs out of pieces. Then what? Life cult? Naylor suggested. They just buy her eggs. Just what we need, Moon Girl made a face. Bunch of half-men that look like sloth. Dog DNA would be a step up for her, Pearlie said. At least dogs are loyal. They all laughed darkly. Starting, starting joking about with, about which animals would enhance Sloth's genetic makeup. Roosters at least woke up early. Crawdads were good eating. Snakes were perfect for ductwork, and they didn't have hands, so they couldn't stab you in the back. Every animal they considered was an improvement over the creature who had betrayed them. Shipbreaking was too dangerous not to have trust. Sloth's about to hit a dead end, Pima said. But we've got the same problem. Maybe not this year, but soon. She shrugged. My mom's feeding me extra, trying to get trying to get me so I can compete into heavy crew. She hesitated, looked down the beach to the bonfires and the men. I don't think I'm gonna I don't think I'm gonna make it. Too big for light crew, too small for heavy crew. What happens then? How many clans are taking kids who are their own? It's bullshit, Pearlie said. You shouldn't have to quit like crew. You do better scavenge than anyone on the ship. You could take Bappy's job in a second. Take out slack and double quota. He snapped he snapped his he snapped his fingers just like that. You could take Bappy's job for sure. Pima, Pima smiled. There's a long line for that job, and it don't start with us. You've got to buy in big time, and none of us have that kind of cash. It's stupid, Pearly said. You'd be better crew boss. Yeah, Pima grimaced. That's where the luck comes in, I guess. She looked around at them seriously. You should all remember that, all of you. If you're just, if you're just smart or just lucky not worth a copper yard. You gotta have both. Or you're just like sloth down in those bonfires begging for someone to, for someone to find a use for you. She took another swig from the bottle and handed it back. Stood up. I got to get some sleep. She headed down the beach, calling back over her shoulder to Nelly. See you tomorrow, lucky boy. And be on time. Bappy will cut you, will cut you for sure if you don't show up and sweat with the rest of us. Nail and the rest of the crew watched her go. 
The last log in the fire crackled, sending sparks. Moon Girl reached into, into the flame, quickly turning the log deeper in the cold. There's no way she'll make heavy crew, she said. No way any of us do. Trying to spoil the night, Pearly asked. Moon Girl's pierced features glittered in the fire. Just saying what we all know. Pima's worth ten of Bappy, but it don't matter. Another year, he's got the same problem as Sloth. It's luck or nothing. She held up a blue held up a blue glass, Fate's amulet, she kept around her neck. We kiss the eye and hope things turn out. But we're all just as screwed as Sloth. No, TikTok shook his head. The difference is that Sloth deserved it. Pima doesn't. Deserving doesn't have anything to do with it, Moon Girl said. If people got what they deserved, Miller's mom would be alive. Pima's mom would know Walson and Carlson. And I'd, and I'd be eating six times a day. She spit into the fire. You don't deserve anything. Maybe Sloth was an oathbreaker, but she was smart enough to know to know you don't deserve things. You gotta take them. I don't buy that, Pearlie shook his head. What have you got without your promises? You're nothing. Less than nothing. And the hailer said, you didn't see that oil, Pearlie? It was the biggest lucky strike I've ever, I ever saw. We can all pretend we aren't like Sloth, but you never saw so much oil for the taking in all your life. It would turn anyone into an oathbreaker. Not me, Pearly said vehemently. Sure, none of us, Mailer said. But you still weren't there. Not Pima, TikTok said. Never her. And that killed the decision. Because whatever other lies they told themselves, TikTok was right. Pima never wavered. Never, she never broke. And she, and she always had your back. Even when she was bitching at you to make quotes, she always kept you safe. Taylor suddenly wished he could give all his luck to her. If anyone deserved something better, it was her. Need a drink? How are folks, by the way? Am I alone? You are not. Oh. Okay. I feel like I've been talking a while. I mean, you've been reading a lot. I hope. It's going on two hours. I'll finish up this chapter and be done. <laughs> Depressed by the turn of conversation, people sta started gathering the leavings of their meal, of their meal dousing the beach dousing the beach wood with sand and getting ready to return to whatever families or caretakers or safe flops they had. The wind blew over them, and Naylor turned into the freshening breeze. The storm was coming for sure. He had enough experience in the coast to have, to have a sense for it. It was out there, coming in. A good big blow. It would shut down work for a couple days at least, maybe give him a chance to rest up and heal. He inhaled the fresh, salty air as it poured over him. Other campfires were dousing out, and there was an increasingly scur an increasing scurry of activity <clears throat> as the beach residents started tying down meager blinds in preparation for changing weather. Out on the horizon, another clipper, skip. clipper ship was skating across the Gulf's night waters. Running lights, glowing blue. He took a deep breath watching it rush for whatever port protected. For once, Naylor was glad to be on shore. He turned and trudged down the beach towards his own hut. If he was really lucky, his father would be, would be out drinking, and he'd be able to slip in unnoticed. Naylor's home lay at the margin of the jungle surrounded by kudzu vines and cypress made of palm sheathing and bamboo struts and scavenged sheet tin that his father had tagged with his 
and had tagged with his fist mark to make sure nobody scratched it. While they were away during the day, Naylor set his luck gifts outside the door. He could almost remember times when this door hadn't, seen, hadn't seemed dangerous, before his mother went feverish, before his father turned drunk and high. Now opening the door was always a game. If it weren't for the fact that Naylor was wearing loaned clothes, he wouldn't even risk the return. But still, his other set of clothes lay inside. And if he was lucky, his dad was still out drinking. He scraped open the door and padded through the interior darkness. Opened the jar of glow paint and smeared a bit on his forehead. The phosphorescence gave dim shadows. A match flare. Nailer whirled. His father leaned against the wall behind the door watching him. Nearly empty bottled booze gripped him one fist. Good to see you, Nailer. Richard Lopez was rib thin was a rib thin conglomeration of ropey muscle and burning energy. Tattooed dragons ran down the length of his sent their tails curling up his neck to, to twine with faded patterns of his own long ago light crew tattoos. Fresher and far more ominous, a whole series of victory scars gleamed on his chest, showing all the men he had broken when he had been a ring fighter. Thirteen red and angry slashes, his very own baker's dozen. He would say, grinning, and then he'd ask Naylor if he was ever going to be as tough as Richard lit the storm lamp then hung that hung overhead, setting its wing. Naylor had still trying to guess his father's mood as the man pulled his scavenged chair around and straddled it. The lamp swinging Claire cast shadows across them both looming and swooping shapes. Richard Lopez was sliding high, burning with amphetamines and liquor. His bloodshot eyes studied Naylor carefully, a snake waiting to strike. What the hell happened to you? Naylor tried not to show fear. fear. The man didn't have anything in his hands. No knife, no belt, no willow whip. His blue eyes made might be crystal clear, but he was still a calm motion. I had an accident on the job, Taylor said. An accident? Or, or you were being stupid? No. Thinking about girls, his dad pressed. Think about nothing at all? Daydreaming like you do? He jerked his head towards the torrid image of the clipper ship that Naylor had tacked on the wall of their, sh of their shack. Thinking about your pretty sailing ships. Naylor didn't take the bait. If you processed it, it would just make things worse. His father said, how are you going to pay your way around here if you're, if you're off the crew? I'm not off, Naylor said. I'm back tomorrow. Yeah? His father's bloodshot eyes narrowed suspiciously. He nodded at the rags, at the rag sling holding Naylor's shoulder. With a gimp arm? Babby, don't do charity work. Naylor forced himself to, to, forced himself not to back down. I'm still good. Sloth got cut, so I got no competition in the ducks. I'm smaller, smaller than shit, yeah. You you got that going for you. His father took a, a, ace, took a swallow from his bottle. Where's your filter mask? Naylor hesitated. Well? I lost it. Silence stretched between it. Lost it, huh? was all his father said, but Naylor could tell that the dangerous gears were turning now, fueled by the rattle of drugs and anger, and whatever madness caused his father's bouts of frenzied work and brutality. Underneath that man's tattooed features, a storm was brewing, full of undertoes and, cra and crashing surf and water spouts and deadly weather that buffeted Naylor every day as he tried to navigate the coastline of his father's news. Richard Lopez was thinking, and now Naylor needed to know what, or he'd never escape that shack without a good Naylor tried an explanation. I fell through a duck into an oil pocket. Couldn't get out. The mask couldn't breathe anyway. It was full of oil. It was done for. Don't tell me it was done for, his father snapped. 
That's not your say. No, sir. Naylor waited, wary. Richard tapped his booze bottle idly against the back of his chair. I'll bet you want another mask now. You're always complaining about the dust with that old one. No, sir, Naylor said again. No, sir, his father moved. Damn, Naylor, you're a smart one these days. Always saying the right thing. He smiled, showing yellow teeth, all splayed out like a hand, but still the bottle tapped against the back of the chair. Naylor wondered if his father was going to try to hit on with it. The bottle tapped again. Richard Lopez's predatory eyes studied Naylor. You're a smart little bastard these days, he murmured. I'm almost thinking you're getting too damn smart for your own good. Maybe you're starting to say things you don't mean. Yes, sir. No, sir. Sir. Naylor could barely breathe. He knew now that his father was mapping out the violence, planning to catch Naylor to teach him some respect. Naylor's eyes went to the door. Even with his father sliding high, the man had a good chance of catching him. And then everything would be blood and bruises, and there was no way he'd get back on light crew for Bappy cut him. Naylor cursed that he hadn't just gone straight to the safety of the shack. His eyes went to the door again. If he could just... Richard caught the flick of Naylor's gaze. The man's features turned cold. He stood and pushed his chair away. Come here, boy. I got a luck gift for... I got a luck gift, Naylor said, and suddenly... Naylor said suddenly, A good one. You're getting out of the oil. Naylor kept his voice steady, trying to pretend he didn't know his father was planning on beating the hell out of him, playing innocent, talking normal, like there wasn't about to be pain and screaming and a chase. It's right here, he said. Walk slow. Don't make him think you're running. It's just right here, Naylor said again as he opened the door and reached outside. He grabbed Moon Girl's luck gift and offered it to his dad. The bottle gleamed in the lamplight. A talisman. Black Ling, Naylor said. The crew gave it to me. Said I should share it with you. Because I'm lucky for having you. Because I'm lucky for you having me. Naylor had a, held his breath. His father cold eyes went to the bottle. Maybe his father would drink. Or maybe he'd take the bottle and hit him with it. Naylor just didn't know. The man had become more unpredictable as he worked less on the cruise and worked more in the shadow world of the beaches. As his drugs whittled him down to a burning core of violence and hungers. Let me see. His dad took the bottle from Naylor's hand and checked the level of the liquor. Didn't leave much for your old man, he complained. But he cracked the screw and sniffed the contents. Taylor waited, praying for luck. His father drank, made a face of respect. Good stuff, he said. Restarting Twitch real quick. Yep. You working? Yep, mine just froze. Um, but that's all right. Um, the violence seeped out of out of the room. His father grinned and toasted Naylor with a bottle. Damn good stuff. He tossed the other bottle into the corner. Way better than that, Swill. Naylor ventured a smile. Glad you like it. His father drank again and wiped his mouth. Get to bed. You've got crew tomorrow. Bappy will cut you for sure if you're late. He waved Naylor towards his blankets. Lucky boy, you, he grinned again. Maybe that's what we call you from now on. Lucky boy. The man's yellow, horse teeth flashed suddenly benevolent. You like the name Lucky Boy? He, he asked. Naylor nodded hesitantly. Yeah, I like it. He made himself smile wider, willing to say anything to keep his father in his new good mood. I like it a lot. 
Good, his father nodded, satisfied. Go to bed, lucky boy. His father took another swallow from Naylor's luck gift and settled down to watch the storm as it rolled towards them. Naylor pulled a dirty sheet over himself from the far side of the room. His old man muttered, you did good. Naylor felt a flush of relief at the compliment. It carried with it the whiff of a father he remembered from before, when he was still small and his mother was still alive. A different time, a different father. In the dim light, Richard Lopez could almost be the man who had helped Naylor carve the rust saint's image into the wall above his mother's sickbed, but that had been a long time ago. Naylor curled in on himself, glad to feel safe for the night. Tomorrow might be different, but this day ended well. Tomorrow would handle itself. Okay. Okay. What did everyone think? I'm enjoying this. It does get increasingly more intense. I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, for this book, my favorite character is Pima. Well, actually, Pima's mom. And then Pima. And then the dog person. Whenever we get to the dog person. But things will get start getting convoluted and stuff. Don't know that I will be reading for for three hours, but two seems good. I think you did good. I'm glad. Well, all right. Well, thank you everyone who showed up. Um, I will continue this next week and see, you know, how this goes and if, you know, folks are interested and, uh, and you know, feel free to comment and talk about stuff too because I will respond to it. Um, but, yeah, so that was the first few chapters of Shipbreaker. Yeah, it was really fun. Uh, thank you, everybody, who did come in and show some support. Uh, hopefully we can get more people next week. It would be wonderful. A uh, nice little audience following along. But uh, catch us tomorrow for Descent into Avernus. Yeah, we're all going <clears throat> to hell. We're all going to hell eventually. But first you have to be in Boulder's Gate, which might as well be hell. It's really more eh. like Chicago. Yeah. Anywho. Thanks for watching, guys. See you next time. Bye. Good night. I just noticed there's a cat.